So um, we are looking at week two now um, of our class in the Heidelberg Catechism. Um, as I said last week, um, my plan um, is to take this at a really slow pace. A um, couple reasons for that. One, um, even, even at a slow pace, there's a lot of really rich material. Um, I'm really excited about this. I have loved studying this uh, each week. I'm loving how it's syncing up with the sermons so far, and I expect that it'll continue to do that, you know, given the subject matter of Galatians and at least the first few weeks of Heidelberg. It, it's really going to uh, sync up well, I think. Um, and um, yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm just eager to just kind of soak in something which on the one hand is like the basics um, of, of what we believe, but on the other hand is just really rich. Um, I mentioned last week, oh, so the plan, Heidelberg is actually divided up into 52 sections, one for each week of the year. And I'm just doing one week at a time. Um, so we'll see how long this goes uh, and under what condition. Um, but I, I just thought that would be a good, a good pace uh, at, at which to go. Um, I mentioned last week, if you want to get a book to read along, um, Kevin DeYoung's book called The Good News We Almost Forgot is a very accessible introduction to the Heidelberg Catechism, um, also divided up one chapter per week. Um, so this is, this is the one that I would get. Um, yeah. Last week, just a little overview here uh, to, to get us into it. Um, we looked at the first question, and as I said, um, the, the Heidelberg uh, Catechism is divided up into three parts, I guess four if you count the introduction. So last week, questions one and two, you know, ask this famous question, what is your only comfort in life and in death? Um, you know, the answer is that, um, uh, that I belong body and soul in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, and, um, you know, and so that, that gives you a sense of the, the tone of the Heidelberg Catechism, how pastoral it is. It's, it's all geared towards, um, it's all geared towards our comfort. It's going to keep returning back to that theme. Like every time it teaches you something, it's going to say, okay, so why is that helpful for you? Why is that a comfort to you? Um, once you get past that introduction, here's the, the threefold division for the catechism. Um, it spends, uh, it first says, uh, we need to know about our misery. It, we need to know the bad news. We need to know our problem, our, our misery, uh, then uh, our deliverance, uh, and then our response to that deliverance. Or as de Young puts it, it's guilt, grace, and gratitude. Those are the three sections. Um, along the way, like most Reformed catechetical documents, um, we're going to look at the Apostles' Creed and the Ten Commandments and the Lord's Prayer. And, and, and interestingly, um, the Ten Commandments and the Lord's Prayer are both put into that gratitude section, the response. Um, the, the, the Ten Commandments are presented as, you know, here's how you respond to God's grace. Um, when it gets to the Lord's Prayer, it asks, why do we pray? And the first answer is, because prayer is the chief part of our thankfulness. Um, so we'll be, we'll be looking at those. Um, now, here's, here's something interesting that de Young points out, um, that um, if you actually look at the breakdown, so there's 52 days total, one day of introduction, the grace section, our deliverance, is 27 days. The gratitude section, our response, is 21 days. So if you add those up, um, those two plus the one intro, that's 49. So there's only three days left. Um, only three out of 52 days are spent on guilt, uh, on, our, on our misery. Um, Carl Barth, I discovered this week, I love it when I discover that I own books that I didn't know I own. I think I got this from Rick because he, he was purging books one time. I have a little, it's Carl Barth, Learning Jesus Christ Through the Heidelberg Catechism. Um, as a side note, if you've never read Karl Barth uh, and you want to read Karl Barth, um, I don't 
I, I don't think anybody would recommend pulling a volume of the church dogmatics off the shelf and just starting to read. Um, but Bart was a pastor. Um, he was an academic, but he was also a pastor. And he wrote all these like thin little books like this one um, that were lectures. They were sermons. Um, there's one on evangelical theology. There's one on the Holy Spirit. Um, and those things are all pretty profitable and a lot easier to read. Um, so if, if you ever wanted to read a little Karl Barth and just kind of like dip your toes in, uh, I recommend uh, one of the short ones. Um, and I can, I can give you better recommendations if you're interested. Um, but in this book, on the, on, the, on the fact that there's only three out of 52 days of Heidelberg spent on our guilt, Bart makes the point, this is in line with what Psalm 35 says, 30 verse 5. Um, where it says his anger is but for a moment and his favor is for a lifetime. Um, you know, the, the, the proportion of time that Heidelberg wants us to spend on our guilt kind of lines up with, with that, that God's, um, uh, yeah, that God's wrath um, is momentary compared to the length of his, his grace uh, and, his, and his favor. Um, at the same time, Heidelberg deals with our guilt first. It puts it right up front. Uh, it's going to give us the bad news um, before moving on to the good news. Um, you know, and, and you can kind of understand why, why, why this is. I mean, if you, if you were going to, the, going to go to the doctor, like you had a headache and you went to the doctor and the doctor examined you. And after examining you, uh, said, here's, here, here's, here, here's what we're going to do to solve your headache. Um, we're going to send you to surgery for, to a neurosurgeon who's going to perform brain surgery on you. And you'd say, whoa, I just have a headache. What's with, what's with the brains? You know, that, that's, that's way overkill, too risky. Um, well, if on the other hand, the doctor said, no, no, the diagnosis is these headaches are indicative of a tumor. Um, these headaches are indicating a growth that has to be removed. Uh, before it kills you, then you would understand, you know, then you would say, okay, the brain surgery, that's good news. I'm thankful that you have a neurosurgeon. I'm thankful that this is available um, because you understand the seriousness of, of your plight. If we don't have the bad news first, um, the good news isn't going to be received as good news. Um, and so Heidelberg uh, is going to give us the bad news uh, before uh, moving on. Um, to uh, to the good. Um, it's only three days, you know, I will warn, you know, what that means is that this week and the next two weeks are going to be kind of downers. A um, little like, I don't know if you remember when the community group studied Romans. Um, I mean, we did that when we preached through it, but when you're working your way through Romans, and, and you have to plod your way through chapters one and two in the first half of three, where Paul is laying out the problem. You know, those chapters can go by pretty quickly when you're just reading Romans, but when you're in a group that's studying it week after week after week, and it's just, and here's how this group is sitting, and here's how this group is sitting, and oh, by the way, you too, here's how you're sitting. Um, it can feel like a bit of a, a slog, um, but uh, it is, it's worth it to slog through that. Um, in order to understand why the good news is as good um, as it is. Um, okay, I just, I'm just going to throw in one quote from Bart. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but this is, this is an example of, um, Bart has a way of saying things that you read and you think, well, that's, that seems to be true. I'm not sure why. Um, it just kind of stops you. He, he says um, about this, section of, of Heidelberg um, uh, that's introducing our misery. Um, he says, because Jesus Christ has loved God above all else and his neighbor as himself, I should say as himself, it is revealed in him that without reason and excuse from birth through his whole life, man does the opposite and thus violates the right of God. But it is already comfort that it is precisely Jesus Christ who brings this indictment against man. Um, these slides will be available. I realize I, I want you to be able to just kind of like sit with that and mull it as we continue to talk, but now it's going to disappear as I move on. Um, but 
uh, I can I can get that quote out to you uh, if you want to look at it again. Um, let's let's dive in here. We're going to look at questions three, four, and five. That's day two. Um, question three is how do you come to know your misery? Now I wanted to stop here and invite a little bit of discussion. Good. Well, several several of you have given have given the answer that Heidelberg gives, but then even the way you have elaborated on it, um, I think is actually consistent with, uh, with scripture. So that's good. Um, Heidelberg's answer is the law. The law of God tells me. Um, several of you, several of you said that. Now, I have the feeling that if we went like outside the community of the church, and, and ask this question, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get that answer quite as, as readily. Um, you know, he Heidelberg says, I know my misery, like you guys said, because there's this standard. Uh, it is, it is given, it is external, and I fall short of it. Um, now, we're going to come back and, and talk about that uh, more. Let me just run through the other questions that we're going to look at. Um, just to just to get them out there, and then we'll we'll circle back and and build on this. Um, question four asks: So, what does the law require of us? Um, and the answer is: Christ teaches us this in summary in Matthew twenty-two: Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it: Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Um, so we'll, we'll talk a bit about why that, that summary is the, the answer that it gives, but this is, this is, that's the answer. And then, and then finally, can you live up to all this perfectly is question five. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, I have a natural tendency to hate God and my neighbor. Um, so like I said, this, that's questions three, four, and five. This week is, you know, a downer. Um, this is, this is the bad news. Um, so I actually meant to put this slide earlier so that we would know for sure what we meant by misery. So I apologize. You guys still did great dealing with, with question three. I, I did want to point out that um, the word misery, the way that it's used in this document, is kind of an old use of the word misery. Have you ever noticed um, in our, sometimes in our confession, we refer to ourselves as miserable sinners, right? Um, and the word miserable there uh, does not mean uh, exactly what we, what we normally mean when we use the word miserable. Normally, if I say I'm miserable, I tell you I'm miserable. Um, that means I'm very sad, you know, maybe to the point of anguish, you know, but it's something about my emotional state. Um, if, you, if you just called me a miserable sinner, you know, or a miserable person, a miserable whatever, um, you would be some, saying something along the lines of, you know, you're, you're, you're pathetic, you're horrible, you're incompetent, you're, it would just, it would be just kind of be an insult, right? Um, miserable, when we refer to ourselves as miserable sinners, it, it, it literally means um, in need of mercy, in great need of, of mercy, you know, so, um, you know, there's, there's, there's lots of, there's Latin texts and there's set to song you know, where we cry out to God, miserere me, you know, have mercy on me. Um, what, what Zacharias or Sinus, so Zacharias or Sinus, we said last week, he's the guy that wrote the Heidelberg Catechism, and he has a commentary on it. Um, here's his definition of, of misery. Here's how he's using it. He says, the term misery embraces the evil both of guilt and punishment. Uh, the evil of guilt is all sin. The evil of all punishment is all affliction, torment, and destruction of our rational nature, as well as all subsequent sins. So it's like all the consequences of sin, including more sin. Uh, the misery of man, therefore, is his wretched condition since the fall, consisting of these two great evils. First, the human nature is depraved, sinful, and alienated from God. And secondly, that on account of this depravity, mankind are exposed to eternal condemnation and deserve to be rejected of God. So that's a long way of saying deeply in need of mercy. Um, fallen, depraved, you know, this is a way of expressing the notion of total depravity. Um, 
which as we often say, does not mean that we are as bad as we possibly could be, um, but it means that nothing is as good as it's meant to be. Mm -hmm. uh, sin has worked its way through everything. And the result of sin is not only all of our afflictions, but also more sin. Um, so so that's what, that's, that's what we mean by when we say, how do you know if you're misery? That's what we're talking about. Um, any questions about that? So, yeah, let's talk about this, this second question then. So, like I said, uh, how do you come to know your misery is the question. Now, like I said, like I said, I, th I think, you know, if we were to go like outside of the church and ask somebody, how do you come to know your misery and explain to them what we mean by that? Um, I think most people would tend to say, well, I know it by experience, um, you know, which would you guys, would you guys add it as kind of a secondary, or some of you did, it's kind of a secondary way. Um, but why is it? Um, do you think here's, here's a, a question again, I'd love, I'd love, um, think, think, think about this and, um, see what you would, what you would answer. Why is it that we would need the law of God to tell us of our misery? Why, why is it that we can't self-diagnose? Why is it, you know, Romans 2.15 says, Paul's talking about Gentiles here, um, you know, who don't have the law. He says, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. Why, why isn't that, why isn't that enough? Why do we need the law to tell us of our, of our misery? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, Paul uh, elsewhere says, you know, the Gentiles show that they are a law unto themselves. Um, and, and essentially he, um, like he doesn't really have a category for like what the standard would be other than the law so that whatever state our conscience is in, uh, however it functions, it can only in some way, like to the extent that it's giving us information at all, um, it, it has to in some way be reflecting um, the truth, the fullness of which um, is contained in, in the law. And yeah, and without which we can't know the full extent. Um, and, and if we don't know the full extent Oh, and I think you're you're exactly right. We do have this we do have this deep desire to um, believe that we're in in the right, or at the very least, to believe that there's something that we can do to get ourselves um, in 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 the right. Um, if you look at at you know Paul's own um, you know Paul's own experience, you know he basically in in Romans seven he's kind of going along and saying you know yes my conscience could have told me some of the law um but some of it would never have occurred to me until i saw it you know and so for in particular for him it's it's covetousness right um so romans 7 7 he says what then shall we say that the law is sin by no means yet if it had not been for the law i would not have known sin for i would have not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said you shall not covet um you know and for him that was the point you know, at which, um, you know, having the full clarity of God's law, you know, written down for him, you know, finally exposed something in him that he just could not, um, yeah, couldn't, couldn't hide from himself and, and knew he had no capacity to, uh, to deal with, uh, on, on his own. Um, so he had to have that, um, that full, that full expression um, of, of God's law in order to show himself his own, his own plight, um, his own, his own need for grace, um, rather than, rather than self-exertion. Um, yeah, again, you know, sometimes we refer to some of this as being the noetic effects of sin. Noetic just means effects on the mind. Um, you know, nothing is as good as it should be is what total depravity means, including our own minds, um, our consciences on their own, you know, bear witness to some of the truth, but 
but not fully uh, because they're messed up too. Um, so yeah, so we need, this is what Hatterberg is saying, at the end of the day, you need God's law um, to tell you your, your, your problem, to really lay out the bad news for you. Um, oh, so um, yeah, so this leads to the question, um, Hatterberg is going to take two different approaches on the question of, so what, what is the law for? Um, so if, if you've ever looked at, you know, so the Westminster Confession of Faith um, is um, in some ways more ordered and, and more systematic. Um, and the Westminster Confession of Faith, you know, it, it, it talks about the law. So it says on the one hand, you know, there's, there's the law that reflects God's character that it calls the moral law. And then alongside of that, God gave Israel civil laws and ceremonial laws. So those are three types of law. And we, we talked about that. I touched on this briefly in a sermon about Leviticus earlier this year, um, you know, to try to make sense of the fact that, you know, Leviticus on the one hand uh, forbids uh, homosexual uh, sex, but on the other hand forbids eating shellfish. And, you know, and why do we pay attention to one and not the other? And, and the answer is, well, because the shellfish is part of the ceremonial law um, that's just pointing at Jesus and passes away once we have the reality. Um, whereas um, Christian sexual ethics are based on the moral law um, that, you know, is still applying to, to all of us. Um, but then in addition to those three types of law, Westminster also talks about three uses for the moral law. Um, in other words, three things that the moral law that still abides, still applies to us today, reflects God's character. Um, three, three ways that it's good for us. Um, it talks about um, the pedagogical use that the law teaches us of our need for a savior. Um, and then, it, and then it also talks about um, the civil use, which is simply that the moral law can restrain evil. Um, and that thirdly, it provides us with a rule of life. Like here's, here's a life that is pleasing to God. Um, now Heidelberg doesn't like break out those three categories. Um, but implicitly, here's the interesting thing. Um, implicitly, it does recognize at least the first and a third of those two uses of the law. What we're looking at right now is the pedagogical use. Right now, we're saying the law teaches us of our misery. It teaches us of our need for a savior. Um, later, I mentioned earlier that the, uh, the Heidelberg Catechism is going to go through the Ten Commandments, but it's going to save that for the end of the catechism when it's into the response uh, portion, um, the gratitude portion. Right, so Heidelberg is going to lay out our misery and says the law teaches us of our misery. Then it's going to say, here's how you're saved. Here's how you're delivered from your misery. Here's God's grace. Then it's going to say, okay, in light of that, how do you respond? You respond with gratitude. And that's when it gets to the Ten Commandments. Yeah. Um, and implicitly, that's recognizing that the law has, it's only dealing with these two. It's not talking about the civil use. Um, but it's got these two uses that on the one hand, it teaches you of your, of your need for a savior. But then after you've been saved, um, you then also respond um, by adhering uh, to what God has told us uh, is a life that uh, is, is pleasing to him. Um, this actually lines up really well. I mentioned before, like these early weeks of the catechism line up really well with the sermons that, that, that Rick uh, is is preaching um, because it's it's tremendously important to see that neither of those two uses, neither the pedagogical use nor the rule of life, neither learning your need for a savior or responding to God's grace uh, is what saves you, right? Knowing the problem just tells you the problem, doesn't save you. Um, responding to God's grace comes after 
right? And it's, it's, it's the fruit. Uh, it's necessary. It's, it's the necessary fruit of the Holy Spirit um, that, that is given to us. Um, but it's, it's response. It's what flows from um, gratitude. Um, so that's how Heidelberg is going to deal with these two different uses of the law. And we'll have a chance, of course, to talk again about the third use when we, when we actually come to the Ten Commandments. Um, we'll pause there for any questions. So let's take a look. We've got 15 minutes left here. Um, so the fourth question. Okay, so um, uh, what does God's law require of us? Now, it could have listed out the Ten Commandments here, right? Um, but it has, it has instead um, saved that. The Ten Commandments are, are in the gratitude section. Here, when it wants to say, what is it that God's law requires of us, um, it gives us this, this summary uh, from Matthew 22 um, that says, uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Um, this is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Uh, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Why do you think um, it's focusing on that summary? You know, just, just two commandments. Why do you think it's focusing on that summary um, of, of the law at, at this point when it's talking about, like, how we know our problem. Yeah. Um, you know, Jesus's own dealings with the law, you know, it's good to remind ourselves that Jesus was um, not in any sense soft on the law. He said, don't think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, uh, but to fulfill them. And, and, you know, later on in that, in that same chapter, he, he, he gives an even shorter summary of the law. Um, that's even worse, you know, you therefore must be perfect, uh, as, as your heavenly father, uh, is, is perfect, which is consistent with what Leviticus says. You should be holy for I, the Lord, your God am holy. Um, you know, when you get down to it, if you, if you, if you boil the law down to just one commandment, right? So Luther, Luther is famous for saying that, um, the first commandment, um, have no other gods before me, um, is, um, you know, is the root of all 10, that any time you fail one of the 10, you've, you've failed the first. And so you really can boil it down uh, to that, to that one law. And, and that by itself would be too much. You know, that, that by itself um, is, is something that we can't, uh, can't do. Um, yeah, so, um, Lastly, just to continue <laughs> to finish the downer trajectory of this uh, this second day um, in the Heidelberg Catechism, um, question five asks, so can I do this? And, and the answer is no. It says, no, I have a natural tendency uh, to hate God uh, and my neighbor. Um, next week, we're going to return to this notion of, of, uh, of human nature. Cause the next question is going to be, well, did God make human nature that way? Um, so we'll get to come back and talk a little bit more about what we mean by, by human nature. But for the moment, it suffices just to say, you know, this is really just relating, um, what we have in passages like Jeremiah 17. Um, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Uh, who can understand it? Um, or also in Ephesians 2. Uh, the beginning of Ephesians 2 says you were dead uh, in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the, the power of the air, uh, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind um so this is you know these this section of the heidelberg catechism is, is just laying out that um very frank very honest um and uh um 
uh, not very complimentary uh, view of what human nature is like um, after the fall uh, and apart and apart from God's grace. Um, now, I will say this, you know, this, this, this week uh, questions three through five are, you know, about our problem. Um, but it is worth remembering, you know, for us that immediately after Ephesians 2, 3 uh, comes Ephesians 2, 4 that says, but God. Um, and I remember, you know, uh, Paul Sonderegger, who's an elder in, in Dorchester, uh, you know, teaching, teaching Sunday school classes and saying, you know, you've always got to look in every, in every passage, uh, in every sermon um, that you hear preached, there's always going to be a but God, you know, humankind is this way, was this way, but God. Um, and that's the, that's the hope that's, you know, he's, he's, he's the agent. He's the one uh, who's, who's, who's coming to save, um, you know, and so having the bad news laid out for us as clearly as this um, is preparing us for that is, is fostering in our hearts a desire um, that there would be a, but that there would be a, but God, you know, what is he going to, what is he going to do about that? Um, so I wanted to, end on on this quote and then we've got a few minutes here for for discussion um this is this is jay gresham machen um uh who is a i think he was the first president of westminster seminary broke off from from princeton um but he says what i need first of all is not exhortation but a gospel not directions for saving myself but knowledge of how god has saved me have you any good news? That is the question that I ask of you. I know your exhortations will not help me, but if anything has been done to save me, will you not tell me the facts? Mm. Um, so that's what we're being prepared for, <laughs> the facts. Uh, what is it that God has done uh, to save us?